see if any of those fall through here in the second game. Azir will be banned. Callista is one that they will put an eye on. Aside of EDG. Yeah, one thing I do want to keep in mind as well is what happens to this mid lane matchup. To me, it's actually one of the most important matchups in terms of who wins this game. We saw Edward Gaming have complete control over Dragons and Objectives because Pawn won that matchup so hard. And now he gets to counter pick being on the red side here. And I think he can really punish Westor in this one. You're seeing AHQ banning away team fighters. The Hecarim ban coming okay. as well, which means that they actually want to push Koro down. They've got to take away Nar. And there's the Rex side. So if AHU wants to first pick Gragas, I don't, right I don't think they need to. That's, I mean, that's obviously what EDG wants to try and say here. If you want to put him on Gragas, which is one of the other good early game junglers we have seen Mountain use back in the LMS, where he can have an impact early on, then it would leave the Nar open for Koro, even Maokai, if, if he wanted as a takeaway from Ziv. So they're definitely a decision to make here from AHQ. I also want to see if LeBlanc will be a thing, because he's been banned so often against EDG. AHQ banned it in the last game as well. So clearly, they were afraid of it, changing up the ban now. All right, it's going to push actually Koro down to... Wow, he actually goes for Maokai, even though Nar was left available. Yeah. It's weird because... Ziv's top two is this Maokai, but also the Nar, and then Koro's top two is the Hecarim and also the Nar, and he chooses to try to push Ziv around than a champion he's still comfortable on. I guess Maokai, he just feels is more important in this matchup all the same. So you get that Gragas, the early game jungler for Mountain, though. It's a big deal. Seems that a lot of players have been kind of going back to that Maokai. But for sure, ultimates, you don't have to wait for a bar, maybe. Just a lot more when you need it, ready for the fight. Yeah, we really get to see AHQ and the value they put on Mountain in the jungle. With Absolutely. the Gragas first pick, giving over the Maokai to Edward Gaming, obviously. Thresh as well is going to be a big deal. Mako had a good game on it, on it before. He's had multiple good games on this champion. Mm -hmm. Also has an Annie, if needed. Yeah. Maybe he's, uh, maybe he's playing it later on. We're going to have to see. And they may even pick up Nautilus again. I mean, Elvis used to be in the jungle anyway, so that's just regular for him to do that last game. Pick up Nautilus. Nautilus still on the team. Why not? It's been back and forth before. Yeah, honestly, I think it's a really good choice for him. Of course, the one happy thing for Ever Gaming is they know they're going to get that clear left Sejuani whenever they want it. So there's really not a lot of steals left. Yep. It's going to be weird for HQ having a first pick, uh, or sorry, blind pick a mid laner. He usually goes for Cho'Gath, which has got sort of moderate impact on the game. That's very true. If they do want to play Cho'Gath, they're going to need something to help him as well in these fights. So I would go Sivir here for and in this bottom lane. He played it before, and it simply helps them force some of these team fights around Dragon that they like to do. If they lock in Jenna, however, I think we might see a change over to Jinx from them, from AHQ. It's something they run as well, where it's so much just about protecting him. We're gonna have to see what the lock-ins will be. This can still be a severe, but it's now gonna be taken away. I think you should have locked it in instead of Nar. You didn't have to take Nar here, with Maokai already shown, and severe would have been so good to make sure you can play your style of forcing picks on EDG. I don't know. Yeah, I, I guess you're right. Picking up Saber and making sure you have that style. But if you're talking about AHQ pivoting, and then leaving the high-impact champions, the high-impact players of AHQ, mm -hmm. the ones who carry the game, Westor and Anne, they have as much time as possible to choose exactly what type of champion they actually want to put into this game. If there's something in store for AHQ, letting these guys see most of the team comp and saying, yes, this is the AD carry mid laner we want for this game, I can see the, the, the merit of AHU waiting on these two picks. Def does get to steal away the Sivir. I love that champion, of course. I think it's very strong. EDG have great team fight. Yeah, I just feel like when Kalista Urgot has been banned, passing on Sivir is, is a bad idea because she is such an important champion for both teams. Honestly, it was also going to be a takeaway from Def. So AHQ, what do they have left? Of playoff AD carries for Anne, it would have been the Jinx, but they swapped away from the Janna, which they most likely wouldn't have enjoyed having now, yeah. to have some disengagement, because there's a lot of dive on for Edward Gaming here to get onto this Jinx. And there's nothing except for the Gragas ulti that's really going to push them away from it. We can maybe say the Nar ulti as well. But then all of this is used very, very defensively. It's the style they've played, like to play, protect the AD carry. It's the kind of game I'd want to see Fizz in, actually. Just something to create so much havoc. Well, there you go. There you go. Wish granted. So, after we just talked about HQ could struggle protecting the AD carry. They do swap away from the Jinx. They want the Lucian instead. A lot more mobility to dash around. A lot more skirmish potential as well from him. And of course, as you said, good old Fizz from West Door. Good old Fizz indeed. We'll see how they can react to the team that looks like from EDG loves to fight and will fight with this composition coming in here. 
That Sivir picked up means they can always go forward. Pawn is yes. switching back and forth between this yeah. Cassidy, though, the one he came back in game five with to win it for EDG. Special for him when he came back against Absolutely. World Elite, obviously. Sick and everything, you played the first four games. <laughs> yep. Now, this is also very much an LPL pick. They love Cassidy over there into the fist. So with the flask start, we're not gonna see we're gonna see two guys try and basically farm it out and rush to level six <laughs> right. before a whole lot is gonna happen from it. And we're just gonna have to see the early impact. The fist, 2v2 fights with the Kragas is gonna be very strong for AHQ, so they're trying to change it up. Last game, they had the weaker mid lane in terms of the laning phase, and that really made them yeah. struggle around the early vision, around the dragons. Now they have a good, good 2v2 skirmish where they can try and force some picks, especially once you hit level six on the fist. Yeah, I honestly think AHQ's comp looks a lot more like we've seen them win their games here in this tournament. A bunch of early game power. Mountain is back on a Gragas. We've yeah. seen Albus roam very well on Gragas. And if they break the flash off of Pawn early game, AHQ is so good at abusing summoner spell cooldowns. But honestly, both teams here getting comps that really fit their style. Yeah. EDG, yeah. When I, whenever I watch them team fight, they're so good at getting to the back line. When you have a Cassidy who's gonna build the Thieves, they're gonna go crazy at that back line. They can get onto the AD carry, onto the mid laner every single time. So, and he's gonna have to just run one way because he's gonna get destroyed if he stays too far forward. Gonna have to be very careful that Sivir is what Deft got his Penta on to take them out of the LPL. And remember to keep hitting us up at LOL Esports with your series votes. Tweet hashtag AHQ win or hashtag EDG win. And we'll update the poll once we are in the game. And Raren with some kills on each side of the board. This is now AHQ. They said, Westor said himself, like, Crumb said the man doesn't stutter. It's going to be four games. They have their chance here. They saw the first pitch from EDG. We'll see if they can repair it. Uh, HQ, if they want to make it four games, they're going to need three in a row. Either way, Edward Gaming come into game two with a one-game lead after a very close and very fun game one, but full of great objective control by the Chinese team. Now AHQ coming to make their mark once again. The signature fizz for West Door. I think it's going to be a whole bunch of fun to watch this game. Yeah, so two assassins in the mid lane, 280 carries. With at least the early game being somewhat the same, Lucian needs to get a BF sword before he really starts taking over the, the lane against the Saber. can trade really, really aggressively. Once you hit level six as well, you just dash forward, you just pop your ulti in your face, and she can't really trade back with you. So that can be tricky for Death in that matchup, but it's not one where he can just sit back and farm. And then instead, I mean, we keep talking about how Lucian. He's a champion that's good at everything, but not the best at anything. Like, he's good laning phase, he's good mid game, he's good late game. Yeah. He can be played as somewhat of a hyper carry if you're really, really good at using him. We're gonna have to see what Ann can do, because he's gonna be very important here. Both Kassadin and Fizz, great scaling, but if a Kassadin with a Thien's build go crazy in team fight, it's over. We'll have to see just who gets ahead, because we see AHQ Love getting Ann an early game lead, and Lucian spikes pretty darn hard off one or two items, so... Athene's Cassidy might have to be very afraid of a high damage AD carry on the back side of this one. And just like game one, actually, both teams uh, with defensive or just sort of middle of the river wards. Right. Last time we saw something like this, EDG made much better choices in the sort of blind pick lane swap situation. Once again, with no knowledge where the enemy yeah. team is starting, we'll see what happens here. And they're doing it again. They know that AHQ likes to keep the dual lane on the bottom side for the yeah. dragon control and they don't have as much experience lane swapping. So they're swapping once again to the top side, trying also to stop this early aggression coming in from Mountain, where he can just gank over and over. Mako doing exactly the same. Last time he invaded on the red buff, now he's going straight to the blue buff. He spots that, they, that EDG, or sorry, that AHQ was starting on the bottom side, and once again, Clearlove and Coral can now walk into this blue buff and join him. So let's see if HQ adapts. They have to go to the enemy blue buff now, where the water oh. just been placed to avoid walking into three guys like before. Sniped out by the turret right quick. Probably didn't take one of all that extra damage to himself, but they still have control of the top side of the map. Great plays here as well from Mountain, as he does not want to tussle with that at all. Gives himself the easy run. And this reporting out, though, AHQ is actually getting experience here on Ziv. He's got Flash, he's Gnar in general. This should be fairly safe That's a good point. for Ziv to just get experience. This four-man jungle or three-man jungle from Edward Gaming, they're looking for a dive with this as they can maybe push in afterwards. It's the same setup again. You have your dual lane, or oh, sorry, you have your jungle and top laner 
on the side with the dual lane. So they are around once you push in the wave. And you obviously want to go now and deny Ziv everything. There's no help for him because Gragas is on the bottom side of the map. Yeah. Notice the ward he had the dragon from EDG. That's very smart to spot who's moving there. They saw Mountain move up to the blue buff, so they know he's on the bottom side. And there's no chance for him helping. And that's why Nara also has to back away as soon as he feels there's someone coming. Otherwise, he would just end up dying. And these are very interesting choices by both teams. Ziv managed to absorb one level of XP from all this, and looks like he feels safe with the dive isn't happening once this wave gets cleared out. So he's absorbing a little bit more. But neither team pushing that hard to kill off the turrets. EDG going back. It's, it's interesting because every time Ziv shows, EDG wants to kill him. And Ziv just tooling them around the map as they're just going to go for a dragon. They're able to get a dragon. EDG doesn't really care about these very much. So both teams getting what they want in the early game. EDG just wanted to deny farm from Ziv while we had the Maokai duo jungling with Playlove on Sejuani. And now he can return down. He just needs to put a sapling or a ward in the tri bush behind his tier 1 tower on the bottom lane, and then Coral should be able to spot if HQ is moving in. EDG knows that HQ is fairly low now because they've just been taking this dragon here to take some damage for it. They had vision on them before, so there's a low chance of your Maokai being towered over right now. And that's why Coral can also return down. There's a sapling in the tri bush. He will spot Mountain, and then he can walk away. Yeah, good luck diving in level 3 Maokai with uh, this low of health. Two saplings. Bars. Really yeah. smart by Koro. He's going to be completely safe on this one. And Safety even in numbers. Oh, absolutely. Good job by them. The buddy system saplings, they will still <laughs> die. Maybe even faster than normal. Valiantly. But at least they're going to you know, feel more friendly going into this one. Now, AHQ, while they got the dragon, Edward Gaming got a ton of damage on that top lane turret. And Ooh. it's actually going to be going down in the next few seconds as the next wave crashes and Ziv being here or not. So Edward Gaming get enough on this one to get the first turret kill of the game. And it's going to be a lot of money on the def, giving him a pretty quick BF sword. Quick ignite there. Mountain didn't really make a move, so the overall kill pressure here is down on Pawn if he decides to flash away from this situation. Oh! No, they're able to just zero him out as Mountain gives him a nice body slam. The only way to survive was if you flashed a body slam. That didn't happen because Mountain was like, body slam flash into your face. Yeah, exactly. Securing the kill, very important, goes over to Westall on this fist here. When you have two assassins, an early gank can often snowball it completely in favor of one member. In this case, the early kill, Westor also gets to go back and makes up for these 10 CS he's behind. Now, Coral might be in trouble. The saplings, they've died. He's now stuck on the tower. Nobody's left for him. Ignite comes in. Great. Dodges some of the CC, Ooh. but it's going to be nearly enough. Alvis holds aggro for now. Walks away. Does die for his sins. And actually, oh. Dev, with the saving flash heal, keeps Koro alive. Dive does not succeed. And you've got a Saber defending a turret valiantly. Look at the dodge from Koro here with his W. Getting out of the hook from a Nautilus. Dancing around them. And because he got so many levels from staying in that lane, got up to level 4 at least, it was very, very hard to dive him. And he misses practically nothing as he heads to the top lane here. Great plays. Very nicely done to skill himself out of that situation. So once again, lane swap-wise, EDG wins out. They get top tower. They get more farm on their top right. lane as well by keeping even on AD carries. The first one in mid lane, though, that's a different thing. It had nothing to do with the swap itself. And we're going to have to see if Westall can use it. As we said, he is falling slightly behind in CS. We'll get quite a bit under the tower here. And obviously, the Kassadin build we see now, it takes a bit of time before it starts really becoming effective. You go Rod of Ages, you build in a Codex, and you just sit there so you get the 10% cooldown reduction. You want to reach 30% by the time you hit level 11 and get ranked to ulti. So it basically gets caught by one second in terms of the cooldown on it and then you build your hourglass until you finish your Athenes as a third item. And that's where you really start becoming powerful. You get so much mana back when you get a kill on assist. It's a build that if the people have been watching the ULCS that I really love and talk way too much about, <laughs> I will not mention anything more until it is complete. Ooh. A missed hook there. You can see the Ardent, day, or Ardent Blaze being applied to keep that movement speed in for Anne. Unfortunately, we'll have to wait again. Push control here, trying to be Headed up by Mako, but they're not able to give too much until the junglers are going to get down here. Pretty much a skill matchup for these guys. Daft also quite low on mana here. So just trying to clear out this wave, but stay safe. You can see how they're getting scared a little bit. But this is a bottom lane that HQ can control pretty well. Yeah. Rush is one of these supports who use a lot of animations when he has to cast, so he's fairly easy to land a hook on from a Nautilus. If you see him charge up his own hook, he's obviously not going to move. And you connect it with him, your jungler joins in, and you get a fairly easy kill. So they can keep pushing it up. Thresh has to stay fairly far back. 
Let's see what happens in mid. Is this uh, a rinse and repeat mid pawn, lane? Pawn six now. That six flash cooldown doesn't matter. There is, though, I want to point out, if AHQ knows about it, no flash or heal on death. That is the lane I want to see AHQ abuse. They're likely to do so. You can see they're already fighting around this lane. They catch up on the Mako. Force giving the flash away. The blue buff's going to be theirs as well. And the turret probably not far away. Clear love goes in anyway. They'll pop the CC. A ton of damage coming through. Mountain goes down to Mako overall. Alpha's on the way out. Double buff. The Thresh doing a lot of damage. And Death going to pick up a cleanup kill as well. A third casualty in. As Clear Love picks up Westor, what a turnaround by EDG. Yeah, it was AHQ who walked into the jungle of EDG to set up for this blue buff and completely backfires. EDG just collapsing on it. Let's see it again, exactly what happened. So AHQ trying to get a pick on Mako. This is a support, by the way, ult used by oh. Westor. That's so important because so much of this damage comes from this ult now with 20% damage increase as well. Ooh. And they just get caught together. EDG collapsing beautifully. Picking up some very important kills. Might get another one on N. Oh, very close. Up is here. Dredge line just missing during that entire fight. Koro didn't have to move. Soaking up so much experience in the top lane. 50 to 22 in CS terms on that. And Def now pushing this lane. Just easy. Cool, calm, cool, and collected with Mako on his back. Well, Def's got some items to buy very soon. He's got to be sitting on plenty of gold. About 1,500 right now, actually. So a BF sword recall going to be able to come through. And it's going to even be in time for this dragon respawn. So Edward Gaming has got kind of all the tools they need right here. And we have now seen the same lane swap for EDG twice. Right. For the next game, AHQ, if it comes in again, they have to adapt and say, okay, we cannot move our top lane to sit alone in the swap because we know four members are going to go in and just deny them all the farm. So either you just take them down on the bottom side and you just mirror what EDG is doing and you take a fast tower and just trade two towers with some jungle farm on your top lane and then you go back to standard lanes or you send up your support and jungle to help him so he doesn't get killed and they have to be there early so they don't seem to deny them from getting to the tower. AHQ has to be able to adapt once we hit game three, because they're now twice being set really far behind in terms of top laners in these swaps. Something we also watched or noticed in their games is when they do start taking towers, they'll prioritize pushing the lanes, but then it won't be the ideal way of pushing those lanes. They won't get anything out of the result or they'll just go for the camps instead of the turns. Yeah, AHQ's way of winning games tends to be very slow and very dragon focused, but that's not maybe gonna happen as EDG's here first. So now they've taken bot tower for AHQ. Mid lane should be the focus where they sit that Cassid in with so little wave play for them. You can also go top lane against the Malcon, try and put real pressure on that and get at least the two side lanes, side turrets right. up. But you gotta abuse the fact that Cassid has so low wave clear in these early stages here. You have a Lucian to push in. They're gonna go top first, expect mid lane right after once right. the tower is dead. Bit of a read here from EDG with that bottom turret falling. They know the pressure's probably gonna be top side. Yeah. So one in the other. See how both teams play off of this. And then we're just gonna have to see EDG react to it. Take the bottom lane tower and trade the two outer turrets. And then you put Death in the mid lane because you know the Lucian is swapping in there. So you keep your wave play AD carry with him. And then Kassadin has to just start finding farm in the side lanes. He has mobility to get away from ganks. So EDG should be able to read this. I like the fact they're trading the towers at first. But they can push even more. There is no one yeah. from AHQ reacting, and Deft is happy to keep pushing. And Lars Ann's like, oh, I'll freeze the wave. No big deal. Even though this wave's going to push in regardless. So a mistake here for AHQ. But bot lane tier two is dying right now. This is kind of that pushing the lanes ideally, gentlemen, we were just talking about. And EDG is able to act on that way better. Two in a row here. And already the pressure has backed. AHQ is in response mode now. They actually, Ann stays in the top lane. They make get core out of this one just a few more shots to take him down and it looks like edg will start to back from their bottom lane fight here as they finally pick up that kill onto coro so they get one kill top lane but yeah two towers died in the bottom lane that's very important makes it super easy for deft to just go into this mid lane and start defending against the Lucian, the push that you know is gonna come from ahq once he's getting a bit of fun maybe in the top lane and another kill potentially you don't want to feed this caster in. Oh, oh. <laughs> His build does take time, but once he hits the three items, he becomes an absolute monster. Time's ticking faster for EDG. Yeah. It's getting even better as Pawn's already got a kill and two assists. He's scaling up nicely despite being first blooded. And look at Deft here now. He realizing you cannot take the farm top. You have to go mid lane. We see Lucian show up. So both teams know how to push the advantage now. And then Deft realizes there's a red buff as well because they just cleared the wave mid. So he will get something, but he will get in the mid lane. Don't worry. That's a lot of self-control to leave that wave there as a setup. <laughs> as we're pointing out as we get into this point in the game, though, Dragon just died a couple minutes ago. Most of the editors are already gone. 
but it's only 13 minutes into the game. The actual ability to tower dive is actually quite low at this stage. Mm -hmm. Normally you see top laners who freeze get punished because you dive the mid laner, stuff gets really crazy, you see West Door in kind of a weird spot, but in this case, both top laners actually are freezing, trying just to scale on up. Ooh. A great dodge by Westor, but now actually a fight may just start. Clearly going to get hit up. The shark comes through, or is it Earth? And more stuns still coming through. Ziv really wants to do something, forcing the Q over the wall, but a re-engage by Westor hops away from the play. Core in the front line goes in onto Albus. This Nautilus taking a plenty of punishment, and where is Daft? Where is Pawn? They're joining now the fight. EDG could be re-engaging and picking up some kills. Ziv looks like he could back in with Nard, mids the wall up, and they do take down Mako. Now on to Westor. Koro's actually low, though. That Nard ultimate just shoves everybody up towards the top side of the fight and repositions AHQ to be able to turn around. Oh. Death, can he clean it? Actually, Han gets out of vision. Now he's got to turn towards Mountain. Is there enough to get over a wall and dodge out on Deft? The ward is there. It's one last boomerang. You better duck in Han's, or in Mountain's. Oh, he's no. it out with the barrel slow. Oh. He had to suck in for that one. <laughs> He's okay, unless Koro decides, okay. Oh, what? okay, let's see, home guard. Home guard. Flying through, that's a fast tree. I don't think he's gonna be cutting anything down on this one though. Quickly slowed down and shut down on the home guard speed. We're really learning how greedy Koro can be. Teleporting <laughs> him for that one. Chasing mountain, he stays alive. Now it is mid tower taking a lot of damage from death. Might see more fights, oh, Ooh. almost predicting the lantern. Man, so many near kills in all these fights. Really fun battle to watch. And HQ came out of that last fight. Oh, nice Q. Came out of that last fight up one kill, actually. I didn't think it was going to go so well for them, but they did claw their way back in a little bit. All that said, though, 2,000 gold lead for Edward Gaming, and we can watch that incredibly close fight one more time. So let's see, Philoff is now out of the fight. If you look at the minimap, Castellan and Sivir are coming in, but they're coming fairly late. So HQ is staying five players together at the moment, just trying to find targets. EDG decides to re-engage just when Meganar pops for Ziv. Westar goes back in, get a good stun and a good ulti later on. So it's looking okay for HQ, but now the damage dealers start joining. Deft is coming down the bottom of your screen here as well, and will try and at least get some kills. And in the very end, Mountain, so quite an escape. <laughs> Make sure HQ gets out alive, or he gets out alive. Woo! And he's drinking while doing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's trying to be responsible, though. He got out alive. It's like drunken boxing. You just got to swerve a whole lot, and they never know where you're going. That's right. 16 minutes into this one. Mountain seems to be one of the first out of the gate after that big fight and the replay. He is able to grab a little bit of control here. There's going to be a minute on to Dragon. So far, one-to-one -to, -one to each team, but they have their eyes set on number three. And a better showing in the early game for Mountain this game here on the Kraga. Still not able to really gank a whole lot simply because of the Elaine Shock coming in from EDG. Had that very good dive in the mid lane though for the first blood. And it's definitely been pulling his weight on the Kragas. I like that. Yeah. It's very impressive. <laughs> We'll see what West Orc can now do. He is in a bit of split push mode for the team. They, that means they're going to have to be kind of relaxing a little bit on these engages. Hopefully, Koro doesn't get in their face too hard as he's been trying to. He's to the top side to clear. Both teams are kind of just waiting it out here until we get the spawn of the dragon. Looks like West Orc has already backed and will be in place. And last call for recalls. Right. We can see the setup we talked about where you keep depth in the mid lane to have the wave play. You put the Cassidy in the side lane instead. He can sit there and farm all he needs. And now you got to worry about this dragon control in terms of the vision in there. There are a few free moves being placed by HQ and only one ping. So none of the teams really committing too hard to it yet. But you can see everyone is moving to the area. Who gets out the control first? And we're going to have another bloody team fight. I don't think EDG can sweep all the wards where the AHQ has. Meanwhile, I think unless these sight stones come back down, Edward Gaming doesn't have a whole lot of vision over this area. As the recalls come in, though, they do have plenty of charges. And we're going to see just how Edward Gaming plays this fight. I think they are the team with the control. Maokai pushing down the mid lane, Cassidy pushing down the bot lane. They're still all grouped up on this side of the river, protecting the pink ward that's so important for them. HQ do not have any deep vision in this one, not on the river at least. 
That's the on the hunt. Looks like they're not going to be able to get in too much range over the wall. Doesn't give us too many options to the rest of the team. Pong can still make it over. They're getting under their own turret now. EDG gets bounced back. A great explosive cast from Mountain. Oh! And the follow-up is there from Han. Piercing light through the entire team. Mountain chugs. The passive can't keep him alive. And it is a one-for-one one and a quick fight. The dragon is still alive. Westo is not done yet. He's going back in. And Shark comes in, but he's exhausted all the same. Not a lot of damage coming through. Force to jump back out, but Sif goes in. Goes for the Mega Narcoro, tries to limp away from this one. Look at but that. Anne is getting time to hit. Oh. He is going to pick up two. And Pod still can't find anyone to deal any real damage to. Finally chunks out Anne. You've now got to be careful of this blue buff, Cassidy. House has come at him, but he's staying alive. And nobody want to back away here between these two teams. They just keep diving onto each other. HQ lost two members. He had three guys. They're like, no, we're not done here. We can pick up a few kills. And was left untouched. Three kills now. This Lucian. Nobody started the dragon. It's about defending a pink ward. And if you dare touch it, we will fight. <laughs> That's one of the parts I love. If there's no other reasons on the map to fight, putting a ward down is going to make the reason for you. Let's see this again. We said if it wasn't Westroy to carry fights, it would be Ann. And throughout this, he got a triple. So EDG has a lot of ways to engage. And they see Westroy on the bottom side. That's why they go for it here. Get some good kills early on. Death, though. Getting knocked back into the tower will end up dying. This is very important that he goes down because there's a lot of the damage for EDG gone now. So despite them getting two kills, AHQ with also Meganar coming off, feel like they can still go for the fight. And will get a few kills from him. Let's see what happens. So Westor doesn't get to do a whole lot, but Anne, nobody's jumping him. All the CC has now been used. Mako is almost out of mana as well. And with the Meganar, and Anne just staying in the back, he gets two kills for himself. And guys, there's more fights. And it's going to be a fight that Edward Gaming might not like. Pot has to jump over the wall for this one. AHQ happy to re-engage. Nice hook over the wall. Mountain getting caught out, but Death getting hit up by Westar goes down to the passive. And now two. more kills come through with Playful Trickster. Mako point blank calling. A third kill comes in. One traded back by Koro, but now he's all alone. Pawns left them. He's left Koro to die by himself. The tree falls alone to the forest, but AHQ is there to listen to it happen. And it's so crazy watching these fights here. Both teams just keep jumping in and going for them. And when you run comms, that kind of does the same. Winning mid-game fights are so good for you because you snowball even harder because you know how EDG wants to win the game. It's the exact same thing for you, but if you're just that much stronger from better items yeah. and more gold, how is EDG going to win? And I hope we get a quick replay on that one, too, because Pawn took the lantern, the guy that could rift over the wall, and left Deft on the other side by himself. He miffed the wrist lock. <laughs> he, like, face-checked a wall and was like, oh, God, God, let me get out of this one. And then Deft was sad, but... Oh, he's like, that All was right. my lantern. And also, nobody's far enough ahead yet for us to say it's really snowballing. Uh, I think the gold is equal Towards right now, anyone. So. It's dead even. Let's see what happens. Let's see how close this was, actually. Westar jumps in. It's quite some damage, and then we smack into the wall. If we had a cast it in, we leave our AD carry out there. <laughs> He's on his own now. Death goes down, meaning once again, HQ can win the fight because they take down one of the damage dealers. When we have all these tank comps here, getting to that back line is so, so important in the current meta. And because the face, well, the face plant, <laughs> I get into the wall, Death's left and Coral. Oh, it is never ending right now. What a brutal game. AHQ seems to be already engaging on EDG, or EDG the other way around, double turret dive, and they are regretting it now. They've already lost Coro. They've already lost Pawn, and now they have to run out as AHQ stands five tall. And let's see what they can get off of this one. AHQ traditionally just keeps capitalizing on Dragons more than anything else. I want to see how relentless they can actually be in terms of pursuing objectives after these team fights. 26 kills this game in 22 minutes, and AHQ still stand at only two turrets taken down. They'll steal away a blue buff. That seems pretty safe. But as far as deep wards, not many down and not many turrets well, pressured either. When do you even have time to deep ward in this match here? Every time we have a replay, <laughs> we come out, and there's another team fight going on. So none of the teams That's because really somebody warded. Sure, but, <laughs> but they were deep. You're right. They were deep. None, none of the teams really been able to set up anything other than just an engage on each other. So it's going to be a lot about sort of the side lanes here, because if you can set them up before a fight starts, it makes it very hard for the other team, despite winning it, possibly pushing down anything, because you've got all these minions they have to deal with. We're going to have to see if that's going to be important for either of the teams later on. The Kassadin is slowly but surely get into his three items. The cooldown reduction is now sitting on around the 30% mark. So yeah, you caught a whole second off your ulti. Yeah. 
at rank two, and that's important because you will get four, five, six jumps very quickly. Absolutely crazy so far. 15 to 11, 23 minutes into the game. Deficio, you may have to start jumping in on some of these fights with me and Freak. <laughs> it's just getting wild right now. Four to two in turrets and EDG. The momentum of game one does not seem to be flying through for them as AHQ still keeps this game quite even. Great yeah. job by Ann so far. 4 0 8, 192 out of the lane. I mean, this is AHU getting to play their kind of game. They got the AD carry ahead. He's yeah. actually held a minion lead over Def pretty much the entire game. The Lucian counterpick, if you will, working very well in the matchup. Westor got to go make plays all the time. Unsurprising yeah. here. Ziv's actually on a self sufficient top laner, and though he's losing the matchup, he's still able to create some kind of pressure. But Mountain now getting cut out here. Pretty hard to miss a champion Ooh. that big, especially with a name that big. And he's going to try to run away. <laughs> a great explosive cast. Going to buy some time, but in comes Koro. He's going to find Anne, but the rest of the team still goes for Mountain. But it's still going to be the shutdown. AD carry falls, and Alp is going to be maybe the next one to drop. Yes, it is. Pawn doing so much work. Now catching up towards Mount Ziv, still alive. is alive but low, he's maybe a hill at this point. And EDG, with plenty alive, could push down another turret. Slowly keeping this one alive, but I don't know for how long. There's Koro, the one to dive in again and prompt the fight for the rest of the team. Tanking it as Pawn, and he'll be able to go in and out safely. Ow. Clear love, swinging the flail, brings it down on West Door's head. Make sure the door doesn't hit him on the way out. And that was such a big mistake for Mountain and AHQ. They just split up in all the side lanes here. Westo was down, pushing one lane. We had Ziv on Nar and the other one without teleport. And then you randomly walk around the river all on your own. EDG, catch him, punish him, get a team fight where AHQ is completely split up and sudden, suddenly pick up some kills for themselves. I feel like yeah. these fights here just keep going back and forth. It's all about who's being caught out of position because their teams are so even, one mistake can cost yeah. you everything. Back and forth is the best word you could have used. 15 to 15 right now, but pretty much enough back and forth. 30 kills in just 25 minutes, exactly what we expected from these two teams. They are absolutely hungry for objectives, and the only way to get it is if the other team is off the map. Well, speaking of being off the map, there's two big timers I want to point out. Dragon's All up right. in a minute, and Ziv has TP, while Koro does not for another three and a half. That's the thing I think ASU can absolutely abuse. They've had a hard time with the 1v1, but if you're on the, on the other side of the map, it's good regardless in fighting for Dragon number four in this game. There's an inherent advantage for AHQ because of this global teleport pressure that they've got. Let's see if they can get to use it. Megana has been popped by him. He's in the top lane trying to push it in. So he will at least try and control the side lanes. We talked about it before, how important it is to always see if you can deny minions and get some damage on the enemy towers by just starting a, a slow push with your minions and then you have this big team fight. Even if you lose it, you might force them back to Ooh. clear the minions. We're gonna see another engage, by the way. It's coming now. But all oh. pops on his on the end. Pawn's gonna follow up and down he goes. AHQ once again are moving too far forward on the map when they're trying to push every single lane at once. You are against so much mobility from EDG to just get onto you every single time. And now Mountain is being caught out. Wow, why is he even in the mid lane right now? That's going to be a quick pickup. Jumps over the I'm wall, right. but nope. a great hook for style points. Pawn, 6, 3, and 9. He's got the most kills in the game. Something changed for AHQ. It just started breaking up the power and numbers roll, and they have been picked off now, one after the other. Baron for EDG. This is going to be a very hard contest for AHQ. Don't have really enough to get Megan in. Coming. Help is trying. Ziv is going to gnaw out just now. He locks down Clear Love. Baron actually has about 1,500 HP. Nobody can really keep fighting for it, but they're trying to push everybody, so Baron is attacking them. Pawn picks up a double. Then it's going to be Clear Love as he gets the Baron. Beautiful fight and just in and out by EDG on that one. Yeah, AHQ really feel like they're taking a little bit too relaxed when they're just walking around the map and being caught out now a few times. EDG. Get that band, we know they will go instantly for it. They don't care yeah. about the dragons. If you lose a fight in the late game, Baron is gone. And AHQ just don't know when to say no. Time and again, we see them say, but but, but you're going for Baron or Dragon. We must fight right. you here for this one. Sometimes it works, but frequently it does not. No cross map objectives taken for when EDG goes for a fight. Paul, oh, good, goodbye. And look at his build. He had enough oh. gold to go back and get another large rod for himself. 
He's getting really, really fed. Nine kills now, 10 kills in the last game. And had just come back up. We see Mountain down as well. EDG taking full control here of game two. HQ still gonna try their damnedest with every fight and to keep fighting to keep themselves in this one. We see second dragon being picked up now by AHQ. They tie those up. Still four to three in turrets here. We'll see yeah. where their pressure goes. Koro, strong again, trying to be aggressive in the mid lane. And every really hitting late game here for the mid lane is we're gonna see the difference. This is so much about landing his ulti and blowing up one target. The Castellan can keep yeah. jumping onto your AD carry over and over and over. He's gonna have such a low cooldown. Two seconds base with also 30% cooldown reduction for him at rank three when he hits level 16. And then you have that Athene's giving, is like 40% mana back or 30% mana back. You have your nether blade and everything. You get so much mana back when you get a kill on assist. So EDG can just keep jumping on your back line. Fizz won't be able to do the same. And that's gonna be a big difference. Here we go, Ever Gaming. They're great at playing alongside Baron Nasher buff. And look at this, a hook on Albus goes Ooh. down. Mago gets the kill, because he wants one too. Koro, where else would he be? Inside the enemy ranks, and they're just pushing AHQ around. Inhibitor gonna go down 29 minutes in, but more kills, why not? Ziv hooked up and killed. A stun on a mountain, he's gonna have to retreat as well. AHQ on the back foot. Edward Gaming looking to push in to win this game to start the series out 0 and 2. A re engage comes in. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to be enough because Pod is crushing everybody. A shutdown does come through, but I think Westor has to go back and was out on the hook. Mako gets his second kill of the fight. 3 4 and 19 for him. Koro on the fountain, not of his own will, but he might still survive the fight all the same. EDG. It's going to take him some time. The real turbulence from Mako there. Taking one down on the fountain. It took a while for EDG to find a crack in AHQ's armor. Once they did, they went from 15 to 27 kills and Baron immediately. And then on to the Nexus. EDG take game two over AHQ. Talked about how when we had two comps, the dust is the same. If you start making some mistakes, it's just going to snowball so heavily in the other right. direction. EDG completely punished AHQ for. Honestly, randomly being caught out on the map. And then the Baron was everything they needed to finish it. And Pawn on cast, and his name may be Pawn, but this game he was king. 25 kills and assists of the 27 that his team had <laughs> overall. He was absolutely everywhere. Got first blooded in a snowball -y assassin matchup, and yet found ways to crush all throughout the game. Hey man, since the days of old, the Pawn has been the only one that can bring your team back into the game. <laughs> and he does it here once again. It just seems like nothing can stop him once he gets a few kills on his Cassidy. And 10, 3, and 15 is the score he records yeah. here in game two. We are really seeing AHQ play into the play style of EDG. What they like to do is have these fights over and over and over. They're a team fighting team. They do it really well. If you make a mistake, you get punished. And that's what happened now in two games in a row. Also, this lane swap, as we talked about in the game, it has to be fixed. You cannot keep falling behind to the same strategy from EDG in the lane swaps. Yeah, you got punished, as you see there. <laughs> no, please. You couldn't hold that, could nope. you? For more on EDG's second win here, we're going to send it over to